Could BP go bankrupt as a result of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, yes, according to my next guest, who has co-authored a new report called Wetlands, Hurricanes and the Economy, the Value of Restoring the Mississippi River Delta, which says that even a company the size of BP, its current value sits at $80 billion, could not possibly pay for the harm done to the Mississippi River Delta. David Batker is an ecological economist and executive director of Earth Economics, which is based in Seattle, and he joins me. Great to speak to you, David. Good morning, Alex. Thank you for having me. Tell me what you found in your report. Well, basically, we did this report looking at the full set of ecosystem services and benefits to people that the Mississippi Delta provides. We identified 23 ecosystem services, but we could only put a dollar value on 11 of them. And what we found is that if you take a look at hurricane protection value, water supply, climate stability, food, furs, habitat, waste treatment, and other benefits, the total value comes to about 12 to $47 billion per year. And if you calculate the net present uh, value of that, so like an asset value, just like you would do to a, a company that has a flow of income or other institution, then the asset value is about $330 billion to $1.3 trillion dollars for the Mississippi Delta. So that's just for one year? Well, the, the one year is 12 to $47 okay. billion, and then just as you would say the income from, to BP is a certain amount per year, and then the asset value for the whole company uh, currently is somewhere over $80 billion. Okay, so there's, there's no way that they could possibly pay for... Well, we have not calculated the full damage that BP has done, and that depends on how much the wetlands receive, the whole variety of impacts. And, of course, we did not look at Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. But the point of our report is that, like Wall Street, where companies took a risk, and then the public cost to others was far larger than the total value of those companies, like AIG or um, Washington Mutual Bank, it's similar here in that, BP is clearly threatening and may well cause damage far above its whole asset value. And so we need to think twice about engaging in activities which can have these kinds of costs. The issue of liability will be fought over for, for years, perhaps <laughs> decades in the courts, won't it? Yes, definitely. And it I won't mean, necessarily be BP picking up the tab. No, they may not be able to. Um, but, in, Alex, one of the important things is this is not like the Exxon Valdez in the 1980s where people basically said, we're going to pay the fishermen for their year's lost income. Now we can say, we can look at a wider variety of ecosystem services impacted and how people are impacted. So these damages were there. We just couldn't count them before. Now we can say if the wetland retreats three feet or three miles, we can calculate the storm damage difference that New Orleans and other areas will be hit with, uh, with hurricanes coming in. And this broader approach uh, really increases the factor of damage, and I think it's going to make the difference between companies in the 21st century mm. that pay attention to the environment and those that don't. Because do we have economics in place, economic models in place, that uh, are looking at this in the way that you're looking at this? Well, we are on the cutting edge, I would say. Uh, so normally, no, and this is why, why BP has probably not paid full attention to the costs that they'll be liable for. But now we can map across the landscape and the seascape benefits provided, such as flood uh, storm protection or drinking water provisioning. We can map the beneficiaries who benefit and give a quantitative value, and we can map the damagers. So, for example, even the Army Corps of Engineers putting large uh, levees down the Mississippi, which channeled all the fresh water and sediment off the uh, continental shelf, that caused a reduction in the size of the delta and impacted it negatively as well. Mm -hmm. But now we have techniques and models 
it's, this is really science-based economics. David Batker is my guest. He's an ecological economist and executive director of Earth Economics, and uh, he's co-authored this major report that's come out. I'm speaking to him um, from Seattle. On the program yesterday, David, we had a discussion about current economic models um, that we have for resources companies, and that in the end that the taxpayer will be left with much of the bill from disasters and cleanups. That's exactly correct, Alex. And I think that this is why it's important also for Australia, because you think about the importance to Canberra, Sydney, Adelaide, Melbourne, and all the agriculture areas of the watersheds that provide drinking and agricultural water and how critical that is on a continent with too little water. And those systems have provided those benefits for free and potentially could be in perpetuity if they're in good health. But with climate change or other impacts, we may be really impinging on those uh, natural systems mm. and the benefits they provide to us. So the model at the moment is capitalise your gains and socialise your <laughs> losses. <laughs> exactly. And don't count the value of nature that it provides to people. So if you've brought out this report and um, if BP is to, is to go broke, will there be a rethink? Is this something that President Obama would be advised on? I think whether BP goes broke or not, there needs to be a significant rethink. And we realize that like Australia, the United States, most countries, we have a gross domestic product that if you pollute the groundwater right now, the Exxon Valdez, the oil spilled and the destruction it did counted greater toward our GDP than had that oil gone to the refinery and been used by people. So we have economic measures which count the damage as if it was a benefit. And we, so we need to take another look. We're sort of like back in the 1930s. In the 1930s, we had no measure of GDP, no measure of inflation, no measure of unemployment. So we didn't know what was happening. And, to, and today we've been in that kind of state with natural systems. Fortunately, now we do have mm. measures. In, we were talking about an article that was written in The Guardian yesterday on the program, and um, it was George Monbiot, and he pointed that in Norway, oil revenue is treated not as profit, but as provision against a tougher future. Is that a good global model for, for the use of natural resources? It is, particularly for non... I think the argument is exactly right to treat non-renewable resources in that way. And renewable resources, what we've done in economic analysis we use a discount rate, so we chop off future value because we're trying to maximize present value. And any time you use that kind of analysis, you're going to try and push the costs into the future and pull all the benefits to the present, and that's just not sustainable. And so renewable resources, today we're living in the future basically from the vision of folks in the past, and there have been a lot of bad decisions which have really created costs for us today. And, and so this is what we. And that is the philosophy about the market and the market rules. Yes, in many cases, this is the, this is why markets have to be more carefully regulated. And you have to realize that every market in the world is regulated. Fun markets cannot function if people can steal and cheat. So you have to have rules and enforcement. <laughs> Otherwise, forget it. It's not going to work. And these markets, just like this market for oil. We have not paid the full cost, whether it's climate change, coastal impacts, and right down the line. And if we did pay the full cost, then renewable resources would be more properly priced. We'd, we'd use more of them. We'd invest better. David Batker is an ecological economist and executive director of Earth Economics. I was speaking to John Roston Saul recently, and he said that um, in terms of... Um, economics within universities, that um, anyone who thought like you, David, had been chased out years ago, how, how have you survived? <laughs> Where have you come from? Well, I think, you know, the economics profession in the night, yes, I, I came out of, I, we used to work in a coal mine. I was a geologist. And we had 10 seams of coal. They mined three. Seven were wasted. I did a life of the mine calculation and said, look, we, this mine could last 140 years or it can last like 40 years. And they said, well, we make 1% more profit this way. And I said, yeah, for 40 years? doesn't make sense. I went to graduate school in economics because I disliked the way we treated our resources and our, our renewable resources and natural systems. And uh, I think this is exactly typifies the problem. We must have a longer-term view. We cannot treat these resources 
Uh, so, yes, I think, uh, you know, 10 years ago, these ideas were not well accepted. Now they are much more well m- more. Is this a renaissance for, for your kind of uh, economics? Uh, are you you're hitting it at the moment, David? Yes, more and more. It's amazing. We work on flood protection. We work on all the variety of issues, and in 